The term stormwater management has been mentioned a great deal in Westford, but most people don't realize what that means. All of Westford's town water is collected from the sky. The runoff rainwater then percolates through the Earth's soil to an aquifer below. But where does it go from there? Keeping the quality of Westford's drinking water within EPA and DEP regulations requires maintenance of the town's stormwater infrastructure. Join town engineer Paul Sterrett, along with Highway Supervisor Chip Barrett, as they conduct a hands-on tour of the town to show you exactly what Westford is doing to stay in compliance with these regulations. Town Treasurer and Tax Collector Christine Collins completes the tour by addressing the financial components. We'll start with Paul at the highway facility. Hi, I'm Paul Starrett, Town Engineer for the Town of Westford. We've uh, asked you here today to uh, show you a little bit more about stormwater in the Town of Westford and our stormwater management system, the things we're doing to protect our natural resources and keep our water quality high here in the Town of Westford. I wanted to start out here uh, in what used to be uh, the town of Westford in our not very distant past. Uh, it wasn't more than 100 years ago that this is what the town of Westford looked like. And when it rained, uh, the rain would get captured in the leaves of the trees and uh, evaporate back into the atmosphere. If there was enough rain, you can imagine some of the, the rain would drip off of the leaves and make its way down to the forest floor. And if we had a lot of rain or a lot of melting snow, it would slowly make its way across the forest floor and work its way back into the ground. The gravels and the soil would clean it up as it made its way into our groundwater or the town's aquifer from where we get our drinking water for those who are water takers in town. And for those who have wells at your home, it's the same source. Uh, but all of that rain and melting snow would make its way through this natural ecological system uh, before it got into our uh, groundwater. But then the town of Westford over time was developed. Uh, there were a lot of things that were constructed like roads and bridges and parking lots, roofs on all of our homes and big, huge, enormous buildings. And when that happened, uh, the natural process of stormwater getting back into the ground was significantly changed and disrupted. So to be responsible to protect our natural resources, we've done a couple of different things all over the town, like putting in best management practices for stormwater mitigation. And we're going to show you a couple of those structures and how they work as well. So let's take a look at what the town of Westford used to be and then what it is like today. And so the asphalt in the parking lot and the roof on the highway facility where we are today are considered impervious surfaces. And impervious surfaces can no longer allow the water and the rain and melting snow to penetrate back into the ground, as uh, you could imagine where I illustrated before in the forested area. So now the water rushes quickly across the surface of the parking lot and the rooftop as well. And as it goes along, it gathers up with it all of the debris and anything else that we find in the road that gets deposited either naturally or by people that are throwing out trash or anything else uh, it makes its way uh, and that will all eventually when it rains and when the snow melts get washed into structures that we have designed and put into specific locations called catch basins or storm drains and that will allow us to separate all the heavy material from settling down at the bottom so that we can go and clean that out. We're going to illustrate that for you in just a few minutes. Uh, but one of, the, one of the tools that we use in order to uh, identify the location of all of the pipes that are under the ground is this uh, smoke tester. Uh, this device will blow uh, smoke into the, the access hole or the manhole that you see uncovered here. Uh, that has a network of pipes connected to it. And when we blow that smoke into there, it will reveal the location of all the places where that stormwater is going. Uh, so this will help us appreciate the vast network of pipes that are underneath the ground, underneath your feet, all over the town of Westford, but out of sight, out of mind. People don't see them, they don't think about them. But this will be, this is a clever way for us to get a quick, quick look. I will tell you uh, that the catch basin structure that you see over here, uh, smoke will all c come out because we know that they're connected, this catch basin over here. Uh, there's another catch basin on the other side of the parking lot that's connected as well. You'll see a wisp of smoke coming out. 
And then on the other side of the fence, which is our detention basin, uh, you'll be able to see a big cloud of smoke come out of there. That, that's because all of the catch basins, which connect together into this manhole, this access hole here, and then eventually will flow out into uh, the detention pond. We'll talk a little bit about the det detention pond and the catch basins after we see this uh, demonstration of the smoke test. So why don't we get that going, gentlemen, and we'll, uh, we'll again pay attention to the structures. We might back away a little bit because it's going to get loud. We also use this equipment to locate illicit discharges, those people who have connected into our drain system that we don't know about. You know, sump pumps from your basements or all other places. The smoke will suddenly start coming out of the vent of a home in the area, and so we know that people have made an illicit connection to the, our drain system. So you can see in the background already, there's smoke that's starting to come out. And these catch basins, over here you can see some of the smoke and smoke coming out from over here interestingly if there were if there were a failure inside of the pipe even out in the grass we would see the smoke come up from the ground or cracks in the pavement so this is a great tool for us to identify leaks and elicit discharge connections and as well as find out where these catch basins are connected. So all of these catch basins have been located in this one spot. You may ask yourself, well, why don't we have catch basins over there or over there? Well, that's because we designed the parking lot to slope gently across to this direction. And so you can see right around these particular structures, we've got a buildup of uh, hay and other things that are common uh, here on the, on the highway facility property that make their way into the ground, but the storm water just race across and deposit. That's, we haven't staged that at all. That's natural, that occurs out here when we get a rain event like we had last night. Uh, so in just a moment, we're gonna show you how, what we do to clean up those locations with our street sweeping equipment. The street sweeper. We have one street sweeper Years ago, we used to contract this out with our sweeper, and we'd have everything swept up by uh, the end of May. But due, due to budget cuts, we only have one sweeper. Our sweeper program starts as soon as the snow's gone, and we keep going. To sweep the over 300 miles of gutter line in town, we'll finish up sometime around September to start sweeping again for the next year. So uh, with the new program, it's required that we sweep all those streets twice a year. The new program will bring in a component that we can't fund right now of having contractors help us. We'll get the whole town swept up again by Memorial Day. Then our one sweeper will be able to keep making the rounds around town and do that second pass on its own. The new federal mandate requires all the streets to be swept twice a year. It's a federal mandate and it's the same mandate if you were in Florida. So we have to do it in a six month period where if you're in Florida or in a warmer climate, you'd have another six months to do it. Sweeper carries approximately 500 gallons of water on it to keep the dust down. It doesn't keep all the dust down, but it does mitigate some of it. The sweepings are then taken, brought back to here, stockpiled, and then we have a contract with another contractor that actually comes in we load the sweepings onto their trucks and they go to a licensed facility that's licensed to take street sweepings. The same thing happens with the catch basin cleanings. Each pound of material that we can keep from going into the storm drains and dispose as sweepings, which is cheaper than disposing of catch basin cleanings, also helps us. The sweepings go to one, one location, then the catch basin goes to another and they have to be certified landfills to take that, which is a huge expense. So a couple of the other tools that we use to help us manage our stormwater here in town, uh, David Hall from our highway department is holding uh, what we call a sea snake, and the sea, sea snake is a, a camera that actually allows us to go inside of pipes 
and uh, then we'll get a, a camera illustration a video that we can record to see if there are any obstructions in the pipe. Uh, we did this all over town, various samples, various parts of town during our stormwater master plan so that we'd have a, a better understanding of our infrastructure uh, condition and network. Uh, another one of the uh, devices that we used was, uh, and actually Jeremy wants you to show us the, uh, the camera. Uh, this is a high definition bright lens camera that we can stick down inside of a catch basin to look into the pipes. Uh, this, gives, this will give us a quick look at uh, the locations that we want to see in ground. We took a significant amount of pictures with this during our stormwater master plan. Uh, to help us again understand well what's the condition and what we found is that there are a lot of places in town where we've built new subdivisions that are in relatively good condition and then we have a lot of places in town uh, that don't have the benefit of modern structures uh, many of which are comprised of uh, corrugated metal pipe uh, corrugated metal pipe uh, was the state of the art for installing uh, storm drain systems. They went in easily. Uh, they could be backfilled deep. There was, there was some good resiliency to it. But as you can see from the edges, uh, we put a lot of salt um, on our roads each winter to, to keep our uh, uh, travelers safe on the roads. Uh, but that has a compromising effect on the, the corrugated metal pipe. This actually came from a culvert underneath Providence Road. Uh, a couple months ago we needed to close Providence Road. Uh, to replace this because it just failed. This was actually uh, the top part and the bottom had just completely failed. Uh, this we were able to document locations like this in several different places around town. Okay now we're back up at the uh, highway garage out back. Um, this pile over here is the sweepings um, that we've collected probably half of this year. Um, the sweeper is now going to dump into the stockpile. Um, I think a couple more important things are is this machine here is 2012, cost about $215,000. In our new program, because of the federal mandate that we have to sweep the roads twice, we're only able to do it between April and September once. The new program, where we have to do it twice, we're going to supplement this with contractors and uh, we'll be able to get the town done twice. Supplement with contractors will also allow a machine like this, which is the heaviest, costly, most dust infested machine that totally wears out parts very, very quick. We'll be able to extend the life on that by, by supplementing it with contractors. Now we're in front of the catch basin cleanings. Um, these also are gone to a landfill. This is the material that gets taken out of each one of the catch basins in town. That, that are on the town roads and throughout the municipal buildings and the schools. We clean out uh, approximately 3,600 of these every year. Um, they're mandated to be cleaned out um, every two years, but where we have so much debris, we're so hilly here, for the last 30 years we've been cleaning them out once a year. What that does is it keeps the material out of the pipes, keeps our costs down, and if you look very closely, you'll notice the amount of garbage that actually comes out of those storm drains prior to it hitting the, our wetlands. This is the idea of, the, of this MS4 clean water program. This stuff would have ended up in our wetlands, in our streams. Both of these piles represent also the cleaning out of uh, hydrocarbons and oils. Anybody that's been around has been to a parking lot and they notice what cars leave when they leave. There, there's usually piles, uh, puddles of uh, oil and gasoline. By sweeping the streets, we're picking up those hydrocarbons and by cleaning out the storm drains that are meant to catch those before they go into the wetlands, that's another component of the stormwater program and providing a cleaner environment. Both these piles do get trucked off to um, certified dump sites and landfills. They have to be manifest, manifested out of here and manifested when they're dumped. So we know that they're being dumped responsibly and in accordance with, with the DEP rules and regulations. 
Before Paul Starrett reveals how the catch basins are cleaned in town, he stops by the Groton Road Improvement Project to take a look at what these structures look like before they are in the ground. So we've stopped by the Dunstable Road at Groton Road Intersection Improvement Project uh, to show you some of the dr stormwater structures that haven't been put in the ground yet. So this is a perfect opportunity to take a look at what the structures look like before they get buried, put in the ground, and then everyone forgets about them. Uh, so this is a deep sump catch basin. Uh, this is designed specifically to capture stormwater debris and pollutants before they make it into our waterways. Uh, this is the top of the structure. Uh, you can see that uh, later on we'll come back and install a catch basin cover on top of this hole. Uh, you can see the black coating on here, which is a bitumen tack and, uh, to uh, protect the concrete from salt, uh, which is very corrosive to our, our uh, concrete structures. And then this structure will eventually end up on top of this one. And uh, so now if you can imagine, there's another piece on top of this. And the rain and melting snow will flow in and, uh, through the grate and f drop into the bottom. And then this whole area down here, about four feet of structure, which is closed, there, there's no outlets to that that will let all the heavy material, the sand, and anything else that's on the roadway that gets washed into the catch basin to settle down to the bottom. And then uh, water as it rises up will eventually reach this location where a pipe will carry it out to the nearest natural resource, which in this case uh, is long sought for a pond. Now the, the benefit of doing this is that we can now come back later on with special equipment and remove the debris that's captured in here uh, and dispose of it properly. Otherwise, if we didn't have these structures, uh, uh, the, all of that debris and all those pollutants would just make their way into Long Sought For Pond or in other locations, the nearest natural resource. Unfortunately, uh, our stormwater management, our drainage system is, is older. Uh, in various parts of town. Uh, these are new modern structures, but old structures don't have the deep sumps. They, there's no opportunity to collect uh, all the debris that makes it, would make it into our natural resources. So uh, eventually as those are going into failure, re we replace them. And by regulation, both here in the, by the town's own regulations and by Mass DEP state regulations, we replace them with structures like this to improve our water quality. So of the many structures in town uh, we call catch basins or storm basins, uh, this is an illustration of what we are required to do uh, to clean them out. And uh, multiple times a year in some locations uh, we have this uh, catch basin cleaning equipment, which uh, the town actually got second hand from the town of Reading uh, many years ago. This is in the industry, we call this a clamshell for obvious reasons. It'll go down inside the structure. Uh, the operator will open it up, uh, drop it into the material that's collected in a sump at the bottom. Uh, we have can just see all of the material that you saw in the pile a moment ago now. Uh, coming out of that catch basin into the truck and then eventually into the pile and off to a landfill. The important thing to note here is that what we're watching is uh, times 3,600 structures that we know about in the town um, and we're always out mapping uh, additional structures that we're still finding in the town. So we've shown you what these structures look like out of the ground. Uh, the, the stack of concrete piping and, and how these are all put together. So what you don't see below the ground here is the, the sump at the bottom of this structure. So the water flows in and you saw from the smoke test that they're all connected so the storm water will all eventually flow into the, the big detention pond. Uh, but this settles out all the heavy material and it can't make it up to the pipe because it's all settled to the bottom and uh, only the water uh, will flow out into our detention basins. 
so that we can come back just like we are here and uh, clean out the structure with the catch basin equipment. And uh, so these are have a pretty significant capacity because it's difficult to predict how much debris at any given time after any given event is going to end up into our structures. Uh, so we designed them with, with a, a reasonable size, about four feet deep. You also can't see inside of the structure uh, what we call a hood. The hood is designed to go over the pipe so any oil or gasoline or other petroleum products, uh, antifreeze, all the stuff that we put into our vehicles, if that makes it into the catch basin, it now sits on top of the water. Of course, it floats to the top. It can't get out because the hood blocks it. Only the water underneath the hood can make its way into the pipe. And then, of course, those products will evaporate. And so that happens all over town all the time as well. Let's go back and take a look at a location where all that rain and melting snow ends up. So when all the storm and water, the rain and melting snow, makes its way in, into the structures that we've shown you before, into the catch basin, allowing the heavy material to settle out, water will fill that structure, flow through the pipe, it'll go past the, the hood or the eliminator to keep out the petroleum products and other uh, liquid pollutants that are in the, so that are in the storm water. Uh, and then we showed you during our smoke test that uh, there is a pipe in this grassed area here. This is called our detention basin. Uh, this is one of several that we have on the property. You can tell there's a lot of impervious surface here, so we have to do a lot to mitigate our storm water. But the water will flow into this four bay area, and the four bay area allows even more material to settle out and for the, uh, the vegetation uh, in, in the four bay to clean. Uh, some storm water even more and then eventually as it makes its way through the rocks uh, the, uh, the wrap that we have uh, uh, the stone material it'll eventually fill out this larger area uh, we have big volume so we can we can have storm water so even after a warm day like today you can see there's standing water that's because we had a significant rain event last night um, and that still has uh, water that's waiting to percolate slowly into the soil uh, but if we were have if we had multiple significant events or uh, the the uh, heavy snows in the spring and the in the uh, starts to uh, melt that would fill this up and on the far end of the structure way over on the other side you can see a concrete structure uh, that is the uh, the emergency overflow so that uh, we don't flood uh, we don't cause a problem here it will allow. Uh, storm water to go down another swale into another receiving area. Uh, and that's true of all the detention basins that we have on this property. They all connect together and will flow. If one overflows, it'll flow into the next because we don't want flooding. And this is the best way for us to get storm water, rain and melting snow, back into the aquifer, into the ground, structures like this. And you see them all over town. So I wanted to show you one of the more desirable stormwater management features we have here in Westford. We're at the day school and uh, years ago the students of the day school helped us become more responsible in our stormwater management by planting a rain garden which we'll show you in just a minute. But I wanted to point out some of the features on this property. You can see up behind the day school there's a, a forest and that's what this entire area used to look like before we built this uh, parking lot, this driveway, and this uh, school building with the large flat roof on top of it. And uh, the first thing we had to do when we built the school is come in and cut down all of those trees. And so we put things like this catch basin and stormwater uh, drainage structures, manholes, uh, here on the property so that it could collect and gather the water. Now let's take a closer look at what some of those stormwater structures do for us. So this is a stormwater catch basin. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of these all over the town. Uh, they have a very important job. They capture all the rain and melting snow as it moves across the paved surface or the impervious surfaces. It captures the rain and will capture all the debris, any other trash that's on the road, uh, drop into the catch basin. There's a pipe that flows out of the catch basin 
and goes over to the rain garden that I described earlier. So the rain garden is a, an important feature because it mimics the condition that we had here before we built the parking lot, the driveway, and the school building. And that allows the water to flow across the bottom of this rain garden. We have a, an outlet pipe that comes right from the catch basin. And all the water that, didn't, uh, that uh, flows out of the catch basin will move slowly across this uh, rain garden. And as I described earlier, uh, students from the fifth grade uh, here at the day school uh, helped us to plant special species of plants uh, that line this uh, rain garden. Uh, they are resilient to some of the pollutants and they actually help clean up uh, pollutants from the water. And it will more importantly absorb into the ground just like it did when we had a forest in this area. And then eventually as the as storm water, if we have a major rain event, it'll make its way across the, the rain garden floor and that water that doesn't absorb directly into the ground will make its way into the reed brook and uh, in, in a much cleaner condition than if it came straight off of the parking lot. So that's an important storm water management technique we're using here at this property, uh, uh, but we have some others uh, that we'll show you that aren't as efficient as this. So this is uh, one of many culvert structures that we have here in town. Culvert, culverts are a way to move storm water across uh, roads or underneath roads and uh, move storm water from one place to another. Uh, this particular culvert is a twin culvert at uh, Beaver Brook Road here in Westford. It carries the Beaver Brook out into Forge Pond. And as you can see from the structure, we've, uh, we've reached the end of the design life of this particular culvert. Uh, we'll take a closer look in a moment, but right now I can tell you that we're, we've started the design and permitting process for this. Uh, the state uh, is helping us to pay for the construction of this culvert, which will uh, be a couple of million dollars uh, to replace this particular culvert. We're going to replace it with a bridge uh, so there's connectivity. Uh, kayakers will be able to move up and down. Uh, beavers will be able to pass through here. Uh, other wildlife. Uh, and so this culvert in particular is made of corrugated metal pipe. As you can imagine, uh, over time, uh, especially with the salt that we put on our roads during the winter months, uh, the corrugated metal pipe goes into failure. And in fact, uh, during the state's inspection of this culvert, uh, we discovered that there's no longer a bottom to that pipe. Uh, we just have the arches uh, now holding up the, the uh, culvert and the road for that matter. So that's why we need to replace it. We'll be doing that uh, in um, another, another year from now. Uh, we'll actually be closing Beaverbrook Road for three to four months in order to accomplish that. We have this uh, big uh, uh, brook here that we just can't dewater, so we'll need to close the road to complete the project. Well, let's take a, a closer look at some of the uh, issues with this particular culvert. Here on top of the Beaverbrook culvert, I wanted to show you uh, how some of these uh, features here have uh, gone into failure. The, the block actually uh, without the bottoms of the pipe, we get erosion uh, through the flow of water. So the, uh, this area has already started to fail structurally. It is, a def it is classified as a deficient, structurally deficient bridge uh, by mass DOT, which is one of the reasons that we're making the effort to replace it. Uh, you can see that there's erosion. What happens once the bottom of the pipe fails and we get erosion under the, the road? which is still an active road. You can obviously hear the, the vehicles passing by. Uh, the fines will just be carried away into the pond, which creates its own problem because we're adding erosion into the water. Uh, but then structurally, of course, it's no longer there to support the road. Uh, so to preclude a catastrophic failure, we've tried to make some rep repairs here. We monitor this on a regular basis uh, to make sure that we're not uh, uh, causing any problems for the commuting public. And then um, while I'm up here, I wanted to point out uh, another important stormwater feature, and that's all the uh, green algae that you see here and in several other places. Uh, this is a naturally occurring uh, event, the algae. Uh, but when we get these blooms like this, 
It in indicates to us that there are a surplus of nutrients in the water, typically phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, those largely come from uh, fertilizers that people put on their lawns. Uh, it gets into the water and then with the surplus of nutrients, the algae just uh, blooms out of control and uh, of course complicated by the warm weather of summer. Uh, but you might ask, uh, well, I don't see any lawns anywhere in the area and there's no place where I see anyone putting fertilizers down. Well, that's precisely how stormwater works. All the rain and melting snow will go off of people's lawns, it'll go into the roads and eventually into the drain system maintained by the town. And that conveys eventually to a natural resource. In this case, the bloom is uh, uh, particularly offensive because it's on the Beaver Brook. And Beaver Brook, of course, flows from uh, Boxborough and Littleton, uh, gathering up all the rain and melting snow along the way. So all those uh, uh, sources of pollution all along the way uh, constitute the Beaver Brook and that flows along. And so we've got this issue here and uh, in several other places around the town. So we're at the Oak Hill Groton Road intersection improvement project to take a look at a culvert that we're replacing as a part of this. This is a state funded project. Uh, the Gilson Brook, which is uh, in the background here, flows underneath Groton Road over by the Ace Hardware Domino's Plaza here in town. And uh, as you can see from the structure, uh, it's quite old and has gone into failure. This is a 30 inch pipe. Uh, as I described, uh, corrugated metal pipe doesn't stand up over a long period of time. So it's being replaced with a, um, an, a culvert with an eight foot span. That's especially beneficial to critters in this area. We'll be able to move back and forth across Groton Road, which they can't do now, uh, to experience both of the large habitats on either side. An important part of this project, uh, you may ask, well, this is a, an intersection project, and that's correct. We, uh, the main part of this project was to put a traffic light at the intersection of Oak Hill Road. But when we do these infrastructure projects, we're always looking for opportunities at, to, to make simultaneous improvements for pedestrian uh, uh, access and safety. And in this case, because we discovered as a part of this project that the culvert was in failure, uh, to replace that now uh, was the better part of wisdom. So we're at the intersection of Wing Road and Tenney Road, location of another culvert that we know is problematic and uh, has actually started to go into failure. We've needed to uh, reduce this down to a single lane of traffic until we can get out here um, and repair this. Uh, the, the culvert carries, carries the Kies Brook, uh, the Keys Brook, depending on what part of town you're from. Uh, this is an important waterway. It connects natural habitat and wetlands. Uh, these wetlands in, in this natural habitat are very important to us because that's where all the other rain and melting snow eventually goes to. Uh, so we, in, uh, in order for us to have our roadway network across these, we've got to keep them connected. Um, the reason that uh, we've put the protection out here and uh, reduced it to one lane is that the process of actually replacing the culvert is rather lengthy and expensive. So we'll need to get permits, we'll need uh, to retain the services of an engineer to design it, uh, design the culvert appropriately, uh, to get the appropriate permits from a variety of different agencies and then of course we'll need an appropriation from town money or as we've been successful in on other culvert projects at getting uh, state grants or uh, federal FEMA and MEMA monies to pay for the for the projects uh, otherwise we'll have to get money from town meeting to replace culverts like this and uh, several others across the town. So there are many locations in town where we do not have uh, hard uh, infrastructure for stormwater management. By that I mean catch basins and manholes and pipes and other structures like that. Uh, we use uh, the old country drainage technique uh, where stormwater and melting snow will just eventually move off to the side of the road. Uh, there's no curbing here or no other structures to prevent them and it can move across the, the grass and uh, get into uh, the nearest uh, uh, natural resource in this case is a, a wetlands and eventually the Kai's Brook in this particular neighborhood. Uh, but we uh, so we don't need 
uh, structures in this area, but uh, there are uh, eventually, uh, there will be erosion on the side of the road that will have to be addressed and of course that can lead to pavement failure as well. So we're careful to watch those parts of town that have country drainage so that we can maintain those as well. So we wanted to talk a little bit more about the financial impacts to the town as a result of the things that we're doing uh, to keep our stormwater management system operational and compliant with regulations. Uh, one of the questions that has been asked is that we've been under uh, the uh, jurisdiction of the EPA and Mass DEP for a, uh, a stormwater permit uh, in order to discharge stormwater into the waters of the U.S. That's our ponds, streams, brooks, our wetlands. Uh, we need a permit from the EPA and uh, from Mass DEP. And that permit uh, captures six significant or minimum control measures that we need to be doing around the town, including cleaning our catch basins, uh, sweeping our streets, uh, mapping our drainage system. We have to have uh, bylaws in place to protect uh, construction erosion, both during construction uh, and uh, after construction. So when a building or a subdivision is built, uh, uh, they also have to prevent erosion from happening so all that doesn't end up into our natural resources. Uh, then there's our own good housekeeping, the things that we're doing in the town to make sure that there's no illicit discharge. Those discharges into our storm drain system that are not supposed to be there. Uh, and so there are financial impacts to that and Christine Collins, the town tax uh, collector and tre uh, treasurer, if I have your title yes. correctly, uh, has been working uh, with the uh, selectmen, uh, the highway department, the engineering department uh, to dig into those numbers. And one of the questions we, we got is what, what does the new permit, the permit that went into effect in, in 2018, what are some of the, addition, in addition to what we showed you uh, so far, what are some of the things happening? Well, we, they've increased the frequency uh, of which we have to sweep our streets. Uh, they know that they, one of the largest sources of pollution are all the debris that are on the single biggest structure that we have in the town of Westford, and that's our roadway network. Uh, and then we also need to be cleaning our catch basins more frequently. When we go out and clean those catch basins, yeah, we're moving all that slop out and putting it in that big pile, and you, and you saw, but our operators are also documenting on an app that we have in the field uh, that's specific to each structure. If you want to bring that around, we'll just get a, a quick shot of that. Uh, the helpful part of this is uh, so that we can start to track uh, those catch basin structures uh, that are constantly filling up so that we're not just going around and cleaning uh, those more frequently than we need to. So to be efficient, uh, this, this device helps us to track each, each of the structures. And you can see uh, if we were to zoom in, we go from all the small green dots, which are all represent catch basins, but uh, all over the town, we have these scattered around. Uh, but as you, as you pan out, you can see uh, globally in the town of Westford, you can roughly see the shape of the town here, that these structures, all, the 3,600 that we know about are all, all over the town. And so those, that is gonna be an expense to us. And that will all cost us uh, money, uh, time and material, so the highway uh, superintendent um, has staffing uh, needs in order to accomplish that. Uh, the engineering department, uh, 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 even uh, in the event of having to collect a fee, uh, the, the, uh, the tax collector's office as well. Uh, but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the expenses that we have and are encountering and, and how we're trying to deal with that. Sure, so uh, the stormwater master plan that was completed a couple of years ago, gave us a great deal of information so that we could begin to get our arms around and put some numbers down on paper for what the new stormwater management program would entail. Um, the master plan was very specific and gave a number uh, of examples or uh, actual areas of concern by location. Um, in, a, in addition to that, the master plan helped us to figure out what things we were doing now what things we need to be doing, and how to kind of keep our eye on the horizon for capital improvements that, you know, frankly, like Paul has said a number of times today, it's under the ground. We're not seeing it. Uh, by mapping everything, that's gonna help us a lot, but we also are uh, putting some money in the, in the capital budget very soon for a, um, 
a culvert study so that we can begin to know the condition of some of these more complex structures that are under the ground. So we took the master plan, hence our experts in-house, and uh, Chip and Jeremy and Paul and the finance director, I believe, helped, and the water superintendent as well. And we, and we got into a room, um, and our consultant at um, Tyenbaud, Emily Sherbo, also assisted in this process. And we began to just go through our existing budgets to figure out what are we spending on stormwater compliance today. And that number consistently came out to about $600,000. That isn't going to change. That's going to remain in the existing budgets at, the, at that amount. That's, that's what we needed to do before the regulations changed. Then we took um, a look at what we thought would happen to those existing costs, so all the things we were already doing. How would that change? And we, we put some escalators by percentage on exactly the people's salaries who are actually doing the work. So we got as, as dialed in as we could on the personnel. So there's, there's a section of the budget, the draft perspective budget, that is personnel. And then there is a section for what we're calling compliance. And that would be the things like getting the hiring the contractors to do the street sweeping the second time of the year because we can only do it once. Uh, disposing of more of the piles that you saw out there. There's a cost to that. Hiring the consultant to help us if we find illicit discharge. You know, where is it coming from and how do we deal with it? And we are going to need some help from consultants to do some of this work. Um, down the line, there will be the need for another another staff person in the highway department and the engineering department maybe not a hundred percent person but some hours um, the next set of the uh, budget we did has um, the operational uh, sort of things that that are new things that we're going to need to do and then we have a section for pay-as-you-go capital I don't know if uh, any of you are aware but we have a capital plan for the town, that's a five-year plan. And every year we spend between a million and a half to about $2 million on capital. So that we call pay as you go. It comes out of available revenues for the year's budget and we pay for it in full. We don't finance it. So there's a pay as you go capital section to the stormwater management budget. And then we have a section that we're assuming we're gonna have to borrow money for. So there's a debt section and a pay-as-you-go capital section. So the budget is broken down in that way and then summarized very simply. It's very detailed and then there's a section at the bottom that's very simple. Um, so that's been available online. Um, one of the selectmen's meetings in June, June 23rd maybe, there was a lot of documentation and the budget was one of them. Now we've continued to work on the budget since then and a new generation of it will come out where we actually are going to see it go to about 926. Originally it was coming out at about a million and twenty uh, a year. Um, so right now we're looking at a, um, a budgetary need for in the neighborhood of nine hundred and twenty thousand dollars, nine hundred and thirty, I think nine twenty six. Um, in order to begin to address the capital needs and get ourselves a caught up and get into the compliance for the new permit. There's two years down of a five-year permit. So there's some things that we have been deferring, as Chip was saying. You know, we are doing everything we can do with the $600,000, and I think we budgeted an additional 80000 for the last two years out of capital. But that isn't going to get us where we need to be at the end of the five years. So that's, that's a, in a nutshell. Um, and then I guess just to say one more thing, which um, I don't know if you want to get into this too much or not, but the selectmen have been talking about ways to raise that money, whether we do a fee, which is what the consultant assumed we would do and, ha and believes is the most fair method because it relates directly to impervious surface. That's what the consultant has told us, that um, it is less expensive for the average homeowner a single family residential homeowner because it correlates to your impervious surface and it isn't part of your tax base on your house value. A tax would be based on your house value, not on the size of your impervious surface. Um, so there's a few other tax sort of options, whether we do overrides or cut budgets or do a surtax. 
but um, those things are all being considered by the selectmen and have been discussed. If you want a more in-depth um, look at what has been discussed at the selectmen's meetings or more information about these things, if you go on to Westford CAT, you can see those meetings and you know learn a lot more. A lot of the information that you've heard is available online at the, the town stormwater website at www.westfordma.gov. Uh, slash stormwater or if you just google Westford stormwater you'll see the town's link there's a lot of information you can see the reports that we've been issuing uh, annually to the EPA uh, for the past 15 year 14 years this will be the 15th year coming up uh, so all those are available online and lots of links with lots of other helpful information and then I'm available uh, as your town engineer to answer any questions uh, the best way to get a hold of me is through my email address, which is P uh, for Paul, Starrett, S-T-A-R-R-A-T-T, at westfordma.gov. Or you can call me directly at 978-399-2716. That's Paul at 978-399-2716.